with you for hours Just let the night sink in With shadows dancing around my skin Some people call them nightmares I take my mind astray Whenever darkness clouds my day But I'm not alone Let the sun shine in Don't get lost, don't give in So let the sun shine in So let's go walking in the sand Let's go walking in the sand Don't let time slip through your head Yes, I've been in love before But this time's gold and that's for sure It's gold, it's gold So harmonize your feelings Keep holding on my heart Like dominoes, facing up to the sky, looking up for a sign. Tell me clouds won't part, I never get by the heart. This is gold, you know, this we've seen gold before. I found the treasure, now I got this. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Ford's Mind of the Manager, the first run of 2022. It's very good to see you. Uh, and as always, we really appreciate the time that you've taken today to, to spend with us. Uh, we do promise that we've kept things reasonably tight and, and we promise to be short uh, and sweet and, and keep things to the point. Uh, just some housekeeping before we kick things off. There are three speakers today. I'm going to kick off with an introduction. I'm going to do a short backward looking uh, review, just a, a bit of a pricey to get some context around uh, how we got here, why we are where we are. Um, following that, Ishrith Hassan uh, from our Singapore office is going to be joining us. Uh, Ishrith is one of the multiple councillor portfolio managers on the Ford Global Equity Fund, uh, and he also heads up our global equities research process. So Ishrith will be delving a little bit deeper into what's been going on in the Ford Global Equity Fund, which, as most of you will know, uh, is where we currently house some of our highest conviction investment ideas, and it's also a, a core component across all of uh, the Ford uh, multi-asset funds. Uh, and that has been an important driver of our performance in recent years, and we expect will continue going forward. Uh, following that, William Fraser, multiple uh, councillor portfolio manager on all of Ford's uh, multi-asset funds, including the Nedgroup Stable Fund that we manage for Nedgroup. Uh, is going to come online and talk to us about what's going on in the world of inflation. Um, as most of you will know, we did note inflation as our number one uh, emerging global economic risk uh, for the last couple of years. It's something we've done a lot of work on. Obviously, it's become very topical. Uh, and William's got a fascinating take on how we got to the point that we're at. Um, uh, he's also going to map out uh, three broad scenarios um, in terms of how we see the inflation roadmap uh, unfolding. Uh, and we'll, we'll uh, obviously get to the most important so what piece, which is, is how the Ford portfolios are, are structured, how the investment strategy is positioned um, to navigate the, the, the possibilities and probabilities um, as, as we see them. So that's going to be the core of, of, of today's session. Uh, so this morning you're going to hear about Cinderella, the big bad wolf, um, nightmare on Wall Street, uh, and even a little bit of driving Miss Stacey. Um, but if there's only two words that you remember from today's session, I would suggest that those are safety first. Um, so as always, please remember to post your questions to the Q&A uh, box um, on, the, on the Zoom call. We will have a nice amount of time towards the end to, to cover off on those in the Q&A. Um, and any that we don't get to today, we, we, will, we will answer subsequently in, in, in written form. So please, please don't be shy, fire away. We'll have a good 15 minutes towards the end to, to cover off on those. So before we get stuck into it, I wanted to just go back to around 2010 for no particular reason. And it's probably the last time South Africa felt really good about itself during the World Cup. Um, as you've often seen on our banners, we, we like to think in years and comprehend in decades. And, and not just for the sake of it, there's, there's good reason. We think it's essential to do that. Uh, in order to get a proper feel for, for what the underlying currents uh, in, in markets and the world economy um, uh, is doing. So if we go back to 2010, uh, the S&P 500 index was at around 1,100. We're at about 4,500 today, roughly. Uh, the FTSE JSC All Share Index um, was down at about 27,500, and we're at around 75,000 uh, today. Uh, the US national debt Power was around $10 trillion. We are uh, just over $30 trillion today and counting. 
South Africa's debt to GDP was uh, down in the 30%, low 30%, and we are likely to hit 80% in, in, in the years ahead, uh, if not sooner. Um, and the unit price on the Ford Flexible Fund, uh, which was only about a year or two old back then, was around 9 Rand 50, uh, and today sits at about 36 Rand. Uh, so it's quite nice to take a, a step back and sort of get some context as, 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 to what's, as to what's happened. So the world was emerging back then from the death throes of the global financial crisis. Um, and central banks and governments had resolved to do everything that they could and more, as it turns out, uh, to prevent the onset of full-blown depression uh, and to ward off any potential threat of deflation, which for governments that like to borrow really is the number one enemy. Um, so what, uh, what, what ensued was, uh, since then, it's, and it's continued into, into the end of 2021, uh, we, we might be seeing the first signs of a stumble currently, was what we like to call the, the everything rally. Um, so any hint of financial risk or economic slowdown was, was met with the full force of central bank and, and government uh, regulatory power. So the really anomalous part for us is that we've had this very extended period of solid economic growth, um, absurdly low interest rates, and that's all come with no hint uh, of inflationary pressures in the system, uh, which for us has been the anomaly. And that's really been the product of uh, decades prior, the efficiencies gained through, through globalization, relatively stagnant wages, uh, which is another issue, um, and a general era of, of excess supply um, over, over demand. So as the Sponsella period uh, continued and having um, uh, enjoyed or, or banked, if you like, a lot of the upside for our investors, uh, the Ford investment strategy moved to a decidedly more cautious and uh, defensive posture um, a few years ago. Um, and and I, I guess the reason for that is the, the, the core pillar of Ford's investment philosophy has really always been safety first. Um, we realized many decades ago that you know, the, the power of compounding long-term returns only really works in your favor uh, if you're compounding numbers that, that have a plus sign in front of them. Um, uh, so it's something that we've been tirelessly reminding you of in, in the, last, uh, the last number of years. Um, so I, I don't know if that's a stuck record or, or the wise uncle at the family lunch. Um, time will tell, but uh, perhaps, perhaps they're one and the same. So whereas 2020 uh, was a, a relatively volatile year um, and the Ford funds performed better than, than most as that cautious positioning uh, came to the fore, uh, 2021 saw a complete inversion of that, of that pattern. Um, so despite all the mounting risks that, that we've seen in the system and that I've just, just uh, mentioned, uh, global equities were up over 20% in, in dollar terms, uh, the JC up around 30%, um, bonds were up 85 commodities over 40% in dollars, um, uh, and, and property up around 40% uh, too domestically. Um, so while the Ford absolute returns were not uh, atrocious, indeed uh, many of the, of the larger funds have achieved one-year returns not that far off from their own long-term one-year averages, um, and absolute terms not, uh, not a, a complete disaster. Um, and if we combine the two years, so if we look at the 2020 and 2021 years uh, in a combined fashion, which is the second column, um, uh, the numbers are, are not too bad at all and, and, and well within reasonable expectation. Um, but that did disappoint uh, on a relative basis. We, we, we did uh, underperform the peers relatively in 2021, and, and that is, is very frustrating. But we, we do still feel very strongly um, that patients uh, will be well rewarded, um, and, and indeed we, th we think it already is as, as we speak. Uh, so interestingly, there was no a single big driver of uh, the 2021 outcome. Um, in general, the Ford multi-asset funds uh, were more diverse in terms of asset allocation and sector allocation than, than, uh, than many others out there, which stands to reason given our, uh, given our, our, our current investment strategy. Uh, and from a security selection point of view, we're very focused on assets with the higher certainty of expected outcome uh, and a focus on, on capital preservation. And all of that in a year where the riskier parts of global markets um, attracted, attracted, attracted the biggest rewards. Um, so the single sector funds, so the Ford Global Equity Fund uh, and the uh, Ford uh, SA Equity Fund um, had a narrow set of performance drivers, which stands to reason given their much, uh, much narrower uh, mandates. So the Global Equity Fund, which Ithra is going to uh, delve into a lot more detail in shortly, um, was largely driven by the, the relative China-US positioning, US tech in particular, um, whereas the local equity fund continues to be dragged on a relative basis um, due to the underweight in, in resources in, in, in the last number of years. 
Um, so while we'd far rather be showing you much better numbers um, uh, in what turned out to be a relatively strong market year, it's very important to note that the returns that you've seen um, are very consistent with Ford's uh, investment philosophy generally, and particularly with where we think we are in the point of the, of, of the cycle, and, and most importantly, very consistent with what we've been saying to you um, at these sessions and, and others um, for, the last, uh, for the last number of years. So when you think Ford, please think safety first. Um, it has always been thus. And what a difference a few weeks uh, can make. Um, so in 2022, year to date, uh, a lot of the risks that we've been talking about for the last come, uh, couple of years um, seem to have hit home eventually. Um, equity markets have been sharply lower through, through January, uh, and indeed if, if you bring it up through most of Feb, uh, things seem to have been, been getting slightly worse. Um, Ishwath and William are, are going to delve into these, uh, these themes uh, and, and events in, in more detail in a moment, but suffice to say for now that what we've seen in 2022 um, allows us to demonstrate to you today um, why we are positioned um, the way that we are. Uh, so these are what we call box and whisker charts, um, and they essentially show the two four global funds. The global equity fund is the one on, on, uh, on the left, uh, the Ford International Fund is the one on the right. Uh, the two boxes that you see right in the middle of, of each data set um, is essentially the second and third quartile of each fund's respective global peer groups. So for the global equity fund, you'll see we've got uh, just over 3,000 uh, funds uh, uh, in that category. For the Ford International Fund, it's just over 400. And then it's called box and whisker because we've got the dark line at the top, which is essentially the first quartile funds uh, strung out to the top performer right at the top of that whisker, and then the bottom quartile uh, funds is the whisker that stretches out to the bottom of the two boxes. Um, and it's really just, just to make the point that the, uh, you know, as, as, as soon as that volatility has come into the market, the, the very strategies in place that lead to relative underperformance against the peer group in 2021, albeit with decent absolute numbers, um, have become tailwinds um, and have sort of immediately borne fruit as that safety first strategy has, has come to the fore with both funds uh, performing uh, well ahead of the peers and, and towards the, the top end of the peer group. So the Ford International Fund in particular, delivering a positive 2.5% in dollars through January um, with global equities down over 5%. Uh, and this is a, a pretty much what we expect to see. Um, so that's a, that, that, that's a very good sign. Um, so importantly, I, I think the point we really want to make is that the, the safety first mantra is not something that we use uh, as, a, as, a, as an excuse for weak relative performance when, when that does happen. It, it, it does happen, it's always happened and will happen again. Um, it, it really is the cornerstone of, stone of, of, of Ford's investment philosophy and forms the basis of our, our very strong 40 year uh, performance history uh, and, and patience will be rewarded. Um, yeah, it, 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 stories always go a long way. So I, I, it reminds me of going on holiday as a young kid from Joburg to Durban. And, um, you know, we always used to see the, the same flashy cars coming past us at, at high speeds. There were several times on the, on the same journey, which I, I could never understand how they were lapping us on, on what is essentially a straight line. Um, we, we typically used to leave, leave early, drive at a safe speed, stop once fairly briefly. It was a pretty, pretty boring journey. Um, and I think there's an important anecdote there because it's, it's to make the point that it's the average speed over the total distance that, that, that really matters. There's, there's kind of no reward to the top speeds that you might achieve al um, uh, yeah, al along the way. And as we always say, at Ford to finish first, um, first, you must, first you must finish. So for us, 2021 uh, certainly was not a year where we wanted to be the fastest car over a blind rise um, into a setting sun. So when it comes to other people's retirement savings, uh, taking tight corners at very high speed with, you know, two wheels crossing the center line um, is a completely unnecessary and, and, and even more so unacceptable uh, a risk, uh, risk to be taking. So we're not here to win awards. We're not here for ongoing bragging rights. Um, our first and foremost duty is to not take risks with your investors' money uh, from which uh, we think they might not be able to recover. Uh, and that really is um, uh, the, guiding, the guiding light of everything that, that, that we do. So before I hand over to Ishrith, um, it's just an important feeder funds um, announcement uh, to make. Uh, so as, lot of, uh, as many of you will know, the, the, the two SA-based feeder funds that feed into the four global funds have been regrettably closed since around 2016 due to a, a lack of foreign exchange capacity in the Ford Unit Trust scheme. Um, so we're pleased to announce that after several years of uh, rather agonizing engagement with the Reserve Bank and the FSCA, um, we finally have some good news to announce in that we are launching mirror feeder funds on the 
a prescient Manco license um, imminently. We expect these to go live uh, in the next month uh, or next month during March. Um, so if you wish to support them in your models and solutions, which we, we certainly hope you do, um, please contact your, your platform providers and, uh, and, and let them know about it. Um, we're also in the process of engaging the major platforms to have the, the new feeders listed as soon as possible and, and we'll, we'll, we'll keep you posted. So, so please keep an eye out for that. So that's some, some very positive news. Um, and on that note, I will, I will, I will conclude um, noting that in, in the Chinese uh, zodiac last year was, was, the water, was the year of the water ox, uh, 2022 is, is the year of the water tiger. Um, we think there's a, a better than average chance that it, it might go down in history being remembered as, as the year of the watershed uh, instead. Um, so I'll now hand over to Ishrith and William, who will give you deeper insight um, into how we are, are managing these risks and, and exploiting the opportunities as we see them for your investors. Over to you, Ishrith. Thank you, Nick. Hi, everyone. I'm Ishrith Hassan, one of the multi-counselors of the Ford Global Equity Fund and head of research here in Singapore. I'd like to quickly walk you through 2021 performance for the Ford Global Equity Fund and outline some of the key factors guiding our portfolio construction and risk management decisions today. Relative performance for 2021 versus the MSCI Acqui benchmark was far below what we hope to achieve for our investors over time. No doubt the relative underperformance was disappointing, but 2021 was also a highly unusual year, which I'll delve into in a moment. In terms of what we are trying to achieve for our investors, not much has really changed. We'll always strive to find value and manage risk in the highest quality manner possible. We do this by constructing portfolios with conviction, guided by the deep fundamental work we do to derive differentiated insights into the long-term earnings of the businesses we own. Now, there may be some years in which we underperform the so-called benchmark, given a very different perception of earnings versus the market. This was the case with many of our stocks in 2021 and remains so today. As many of you already know, valuations in segments of the market reached exuberant levels over the past 12 months. And we chose to prioritize managing risk through buying into future earning streams at fractions of their true worth versus following expensive momentum stocks, which is evident in both the names we hold and our very different portfolio construction versus the market or benchmark. So let's take a quick look at the state of the market, why we're cautious and our major holdings, which should give you a good sense for this embedded margin of safety in our portfolio. 2021 was a highly unusual year to say the least. Emerging from a COVID distorted 2020 where the developed world and particularly the United States was flooded with liquidity in the form of unprecedented money printing and stimulus checks, which increased the total dollars in circulation by more than a historic 30%. To put that into perspective, that was far more than the money printed during the financial, uh, financial crisis and the Great Depression combined. All this resulted in a wonky market environment where earnings fundamentals had little to do with stock price performance, which was evident, which was evident in the many bubbles we've seen from cryptocurrencies to NFTs, to new energy businesses, to SaaS stocks, SPACs, IPOs, and many other speculative assets. It's truly been a bubble of everything, or at least the most ridiculous things. This environment has led to US market valuations approaching levels only seen three times in the past 100 years, with the last time being the dot-com bubble in 2000, and we all know how that ended. The US, and particularly its technology sector, are valued extremely richly versus the rest of the world, where value is far more compelling with lower risk, which is a combination we tend to like a lot. For instance, the US market, which incidentally makes up more than 60% of our benchmark, has been held up by a very narrow group of mega stocks. The 10 largest stocks now account for 30% of the S&P 500, while the top five alone accounted for more than a third of its gains in the past 12 months. Furthermore, the, the trailing price to earnings ratio of these top 10 stocks as of December was roughly 70% higher than their average multiple over the past 25 years. 
and that quarter century included the tech bubble years of the late 90s. Since 1980, there have been 11 instances in which market breadth narrowed as sharply as it did in 2021, which usually indicates a very unhealthy market beneath the hood, despite what the annual performance would suggest. This level of market narrowness typically foreshadows very poor returns in subsequent periods. All this also coincides with a highly inflationary environment where the Fed must now raise interest rates far more than people expect, which is very ominous for these expensive segments of the market that are not supported by their earnings or cash flows. So how was Ford positioned against this backdrop? As many of you know, we never take zero one positions. So within the US tech landscape, we do have sizable exposure to Google, which is our largest holding given its compelling relative value versus the rest of the pack. We also hold smaller positions in Microsoft, Netflix and Spotify, where we've been cautiously adding into this uh, recent sell off. However, our major variant perception from the market comes in our outsized position in Chinese technology businesses, which was the biggest factor behind our relative underperformance last year. The circle parts of this table help clarify why we like these businesses last year and why we love them today. China tech is growing faster than US tech, yet trades at a fraction of their value. What's also different is that unlike their US counterparts, the top Chinese management teams have been rampantly reinvesting their capital at very high rates of return like venture capital businesses over the past decade. And if you exclude these investments from their value, the stocks are truly trading at cents on the dollar, which is why we continue to add to them into market fears around regulation. Regulation is another area where we have a very different understanding from the market particularly relating to its impact on future earnings. The Western media portrays China's regulatory actions as anti-business, anti-profit or anti-capitalist. But this is very different to the reality on the ground, which we've been very close to over the past decade. These uh, technology businesses have just grown too fast and expanded into so many different areas of the economy that the Chinese government simply wants to ensure that these expansions are happening in a high quality manner that also benefits society at large. They have no real intention to kill capitalism or the dynamism of the industry as is portrayed in the Western press, which has been a key reason behind recent selling pressure. China simply wants to ensure sustainable quality growth of the economy versus the unfettered growth of the past two decades, which makes perfect sense to us, particularly given the power now wielded by these technology giants. Even if you consider the $2.8 billion antitrust fine or common uh, prosperity initiatives in the case of Alibaba, it pales in comparison to the $5 billion fine imposed on Google in just the EU, with more likely to come. Yet in China's case, these fines have been interpreted very differently by the market, while in essence, it's the same thing. To be clear, there's also a macro slowdown underway in China, which does impact near term earnings of these businesses. However, our analysis of how these earnings will inevitably evolve, evolve over time suggests incredibly asymmetric risk reward from here. Just as one is excited by the prospect of buying a dollar at 30 cents, we remain uh, incredibly excited to own these, uh, own these stocks in size today. As uh, Warren Buffett says, be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. Today, there's a clear dislocation between sentiment and the inevitable fundamentals in our mind. And we were positioned accordingly, which, which hurt us last year. But ultimately, as always, earnings will prevail. We're already starting to see some signs of uh, this in the recent sell off as China tech earnings exp uh, exceed very low expectations and US tech disappoints against exuberant expectations. Last year, we, we also chose to have sizable exposure to several high quality um, and extremely cheap gold and silver focused businesses like Pan American Silver and Wheaton Precious Metals, both of which provide our investors with uh, excellent insurance policy against infl inflation or a market shock, but both of which underperformed in 2021. 
as with most, most insurance policies, we hope we don't have to collect on a new crisis. But even in the event of rampant inflation like today, our investors should benefit handsomely from these positions. Whatever the scenario, these businesses provide us with exceptional value and strong cash returns, even at spot metal prices. So to conclude, while the 2021 underperformance was clearly disappointing, our portfolio has tremendous value and margin of safety embedded in it. And as the gap between our analysis of earnings and the market's unfounded sentiment is resolved over time, the global equity fund should benefit tremendously both on an absolute and relative basis. With that, thank you for joining us today. It's been a privilege and honor to serve our investors through these tricky times. And uh, I'd be delighted to go through our stocks and portfolio construction in greater detail anytime. And with that, uh, hand it over to you, William. Thank you, Yitri. My name is William Fraser, and I'm one of the multi councillor portfolio managers on the multi asset portfolios in South Africa. The title of my presentation on global inflation is Fairy Tales. Our fairy tales are stories that's based on folklore or myth. It's also, also trite to say that fairy tale endings seldom come to pass. Fairy tales also include cautionary tales that warn readers about the danger, dangers that are often ignored at a great cost to the reader. The inflation story that I will tell is definitely real. The investors need to take note, and if they don't, they do so at their own peril. But I have devised three fairy tales or scenarios which I will share with you, and these might come to pass. One of them has the classic fairy tale ending of happily ever after. Two of them have endings that are not so, not so good and significantly worse. You can devise your own fairy tales if you wish, or even your own probabilities. The reality is that ultimately, uh, the true inflation scenario will settle somewhere between the probabilities that I will talk about. Now, inflation is our topic. In this chart, I show you the most recent inflation numbers of both developed market economies and also emerging market economies. Those areas that are shaded in red show periods of hot inflation or fast inflation and those in green, more slower inflation. It is very clear in the slide that developed economies are in a process or in a phase of a synchronized inflation cycle. Interestingly enough, emerging market economies have inflation that is not as significant as it has been in the past, in particular if you compare it to the late 1990s, but it is picking up. The question we have to ask ourselves is, how did we get to this point? Now, when COVID lockdowns shut e uh, economies, the government responded with fiscal support to both households and businesses. That free money was used to buy goods. To put it in context, the fiscal support totaled $17 trillion or 16% of GDP. Now what's clear in this chart is that the retail sales in the US increased at a significantly faster pace post COVID compared to the decade before. It's roughly 10% per annum compared to 4% per annum in the prior, uh, prior decade. And history has told us that periods of significant increases in either money supply or disposable income is characterized by relatively fast inflation. Now, while the world has gone on a shopping spree, most factories around the world shut down. 
And we can see in this chart that there is a significant correlation between all the pressures in the global supply chain and global inflation. So how did we get here? To answer it in relatively simple terms, demand increased significantly, but supply shrunk, and that put an upward pressure on prices. Now, governments have started to rein in all the free money, but demand has remained relatively strong. Why? Why is that? On this chart, I show you in black the Federal Reserve Labor Market Conditions Index and in red, U.S. Employment Cost Index. The Labor Market Condition Index is just a combination of uh, 16 underlying employment indices that they put together. And what we can take from this chart is that we are in a period of a very tight labor market. The labor conditions are tight, and that's leading to an increase in the number of people that's employed. And at the same time, it is leading to higher wages for those that are employed or finding new employment opportunities. So we have more people that's employed, and they are earning more. And that is leading to a continuation of the demand that we've seen just after COVID. Now this next slide is a very interesting chart. Now I haven't really seen it anywhere else before. The Fed has not responded to the very tight labor market. And that is different from the past. The shaded areas I show are periods where the labor market condition index is above zero and rising. In other words, the labor market is growing faster than it has through a normal cycle. Historically, the Fed has started to tighten policy when this labor market, con inde labor market condition index moved above zero. But because the Fed thought that inflation was going to be temporary, they held back on increasing interest rates. What really struck me from looking at this chart is the fear or the concern that the Fed may make two mistakes in a very short space of time. Number one, they didn't hike rates when they were meant to. And number two, they may continue to hike interest rates at a time when the labor market starts to lose momentum. Because you'll notice on this chart as well that unlike um, what might happen in the new cycle. In previous cycles, the Fed ceased increasing interest rates when the labor market started to lose momentum. That's something that they haven't done before, as I've mentioned. Now, executives definitely do not believe that the inflation that we see today is transitory. We can see from the responses of executives in a conference board survey that the majority believe that they are facing a significant upward pressure on input costs. Secondly, most of them also believe that this increase in uh, input cost is not a short term phenomenon. Most of them believe that the pressure is going to increase in, the pressure is going to carry on well into 2023 and possibly beyond in 2023. So what are executives doing about this pressure of input cost? Most of them want to cut costs, but that is very difficult to do when you consider that the top three pressures they're seeing is supply bottlenecks, labor shortages, and energy prices. And very soon, uh, interest expense on the income statement. It is very difficult to cut cost when the things that's increasing is out of your control. It's more likely that the majority of businesses will want to pass on the increases downstream to their own customers. Now, given the lack of alternatives other than to increase prices, inflation expectations are on the move. Inflation expectations 
as we know, can feed on themselves, as does inflation. We in SA are very, very familiar with this process. Now, the Fed will be extremely concerned about this upward trajectory of inflation expectations, given that price stability is one of their core mandates. The Fed cannot afford for inflation expectations to stay elevated for too long. So we all know that interest rates are on the rise. The question that we need to ask ourselves, well, there's many. But the questions are, is the expected change in interest rates priced into the market? Number two, what are the probabilities of interest rate increases moving in a direction other than what the market is pricing in? And number three, how will investors react to a different path of interest rates compared to current market expectations? And we all know that the market gets it wrong. They either over or underestimate the future path of interest rate increases. Note how in this chart, the market always underestimates uh, the expected increases in the Fed funds rate, and they only catch up as interest rate moves higher. For a long time, the market believed the Fed. The market believed that interest rates were likely to stay at 0% or extremely low for a short space of time, and only quite recently started to change their view. But what has changed? We learned quite a bit in Jan, 2022, that is. Number one is that we learned the Fed changed the view on inflation. And they've been communicating this quite actively in the marketplace. Where in the past they believed that inflation is transitory, they now are concerned about inflation becoming more endemic in the economy. Number two, we've also learned that the Fed is talking about a change in the previous trajectory of interest rates. They're talking about hiking faster, talking about not hike, hiking only in 25 basis point increments, but in 50 basis point increments potentially. And more recently, they're talking about even hiking out of the normal meetings that set. And that will be something that hasn't happened for the last two decades. We can see on this chart that in the space of roughly five weeks, the market's expectations of interest rates, and this is by the end of 2022, changed from a rate of 75 basis points to a rate of 1.75% or 175 basis points. That's an additional 1% in increases in rates that wasn't expected at uh, the end of 2021. And this, yeah, this was not expected, as I mentioned. And uh, as Nick and Israel have spoken about, it changed the view investors had on equity markets, on bond yields, and even on credit. Now, if inflation expectations continue to increase, and the Fed talks stuff about interest rate increases, then we should expect more volatility in asset classes ranging from equities to bonds to credit and alternative assets. Now, equities is a very good long-term protector of uh, capital in real terms. But even equities do not enjoy unexpected and rising inflation. The shaded area in this chart shows periods where the last 12-month inflation number is higher than the last 10 years of inflation. In other words, it's indicating inflation that is building momentum in an economy. And in just about all these periods, one can see that the market PE has derated quite significantly. But there are many reasons for this derating. Number one is that as inflation builds momentum and interest rate increases takes hold in the economy, bond yields move higher. And because equities are priced of the bond yields in some you know, models, um, earnings yield on, on equity markets increase. And that means that your PEs decline. 
Secondly, as interest rates move higher, generally the Fed makes the mistake of tightening too far and too much. And that kills off economic activity and economic growth. And because economic growth stalls, the earnings of companies come to a halt. There's no growth in earnings, and in many cases, earnings contract. And that's not good for equity market ratings. And typically, investors start to move out of equities well ahead of the decline in earnings. And that comes to the third point, which is momentum. So as investors start to sell out of equities, technical factors come into play, and more and more sellers enter the market. And we get into the cycle of equity markets moving lower and lower. In the past, we had the luxury of diversifying into alternative assets when we get concerned about the valuation of, let's say, equity markets. We could move into cash or bonds. Even credit was an option out there. But another asset class that's benefited significantly from all the free money that has been pumped into the global financial system has been credit. Investors that's been desperate for yield in a world of 0% interest have moved down the quality spectrum and they've moved into credit. We can see here that the correlation between yields on credit and earnings yield on equity markets have increased quite significantly in the more recent past. If the concern here is that if previous cycles repeat and equity markets yield rise in line with expectation, then there's a real risk of a stampede out of credit um, which will be very detrimental to those that own credit in their portfolios. Okay, I'm now going, going to come to the three scenarios out there and my fairy tales. The first one is Cinderella, and we know Cinderella re relatively well. In this scenario, Cinderella has been dancing at the ball since 2008, but still the band, or is it the bank, continues to play. Not many guests have left. In fact, many more that initially declined the invitation belatedly is making their way to the castle and they're joining in the festivities. We've been waiting for the clock to strike midnight, but time sure seems to be standing still. There appears to be no ugly sisters in sight, but they are there. They are around but every time they want to inflict some damage on Cinderella, the fairy godmother, let's call her the Fed, comes to the rescue, intervenes, and saves the day. All seems to be well, and thus far, it has ended well. In this version of our fairy tale, the clock does move, but very slowly to 12 o'clock. But we think that Cinderella will be able to make a Class C exit. So the Fed manages to manufacture a classic happily ever after ending. Interest rate increases very slowly, but sufficiently to stem inflation. Not enough to kill off growth, and that supports equity markets. Equity markets therefore continue to rise but less so in the expensive US market due to the valuation concerns that Ishrith has spoken about. The rest of the world equity markets fare much better. Bond yields rise, but only in line with inflation and short-term interest rates. And that will further support equity markets. Emerging market economies like SA will find favor from this outcome, and we benefit because demand for economies remain relatively strong in a world where the global economy continues to grow. From an SA investor perspective, the, man, the rent remains well protected and well supported. Our own inflation number settles somewhere between 45 and 5%, and the repo rate only increases moderately to around 5 to 6%. Even our bond yields seem to catch a bit in this scenario. It is indeed happily ever after. 
The second scenario is called the big bad wolf. And you can see that I've assigned a very decent probability to this particular outcome. In this tale, the silent and sometimes invisible big bad wolf starts as a beast that at last manages to eat his full. Unlike his much friendlier cousins that terrorize his red riding hood and the three little pigs, this monster works in the dark and in the shadows, devouring life savings after the hunter fails to capture and kill him. The hunter, you see, initially was fast asleep. And when he eventually woke up, he thought that he had a lot of time to catch the wolf. Because you see, the wolf was going to take a long and winding road to get to his victim. However, the wolf, as is his wont, took the same path he always took and arrived there the same time he always has taking his victim completely by surprise. The risk to inflation, or the risk that inflation poses to investor savings, should not be underestimated. And we sign a very high probability to an outcome where it takes the Fed some time to tame the beast. As we have seen, even equities, despite the inflation protection that's offered by earnings, suffer when inflation rises faster than expected and gather momentum. Some sectors does well because we know that the companies have pricing power. Others are far more sensitive to increases in inflation and long-term bond yields and you want to avoid being overexposed to those businesses. For domestic investors, one wants to be invested more in non-commodity rand hedges because that's where in the past and in the future scenario we believe the best inflation protection will be provided. Bonds offer very little protection in this scenario, given the starting yield of international bonds and even for SA, given that our bonds are linked to global bond yields. Investors will be better off at the shorter end of the curve, despite the lack of yield that that initially offer. The, the third scenario is called Nightmare on Wall Street. And I've assigned the lowest probability to this outcome. Here there is no happily ever after. The nightmare unfolds when the main protagonist in the story in an attempt to restore balance to the universe, puts in motion a series of unfortunate events. Though his actions seem relatively innocent, they are sufficient to destabilize the centers of power, causing untold harm to many. It would take many years to restore order to the universe, and sadly, many never see light again. We do not know how the biggest financial experiment in the world will end. But we are definitely closer to finding out. The combination of interest rate increases and quantitative tightening will suck an enormous amount of liquidity out of the global economy and the financial system. There is a distinct possibility that the financial system will not be able to cope given the enormity of the situation. The uncertainty is likely to curtail spending and investment and destroy investment and, and, uh, and confidence. Equity markets crash in line with previous post-bubble events. Bond yields plummet, as does inflation. As the great global recession unfolds, emerging markets are left in tatters. Local rand currency and bond yields uh, blow out and domestic rates rise significantly from current levels. Given the scenarios, 
that I've painted and the probabilities that I've assigned to the different outcomes, it shouldn't really come as a surprise that we continue to favor equities to protect against the long-term risks of inflation for our investors. But we have taken some specific action to protect investors' capital in the fund. We are favoring select equities in the Ford International Fund, which is our flagship global flexible mandate, which through the ability to pass on inflationary increases through earnings um, to protect the capital of our investors in real terms. We have a much lower allocation to the expensive US market. And we've done so by implementing a short S&P future position as a hedge against, number one, the general overvaluation of that market, but secondly, the decent and sizable allocation of expensive tech in that, uh, uh, in that index in particular. We put quite a high probability on a correction in the US, given the factors that I've mentioned. In the Ford International Fund, we continue to avoid long-dated government bonds, given the entry yields, which, after taking inflation into account, is still deeply negative. The yields are moving higher, and volatility in the bond indices are increasing uh, significantly. And that, we believe, will allow us to enter bond yields at much higher levels. We do continue to value the role gold can play in our portfolios. And there's a sizable allocation to the gold ETF and commodity equities uh, in the fund as well, which we believe will protect our investors' capital against increasing inflation risk in general and more specific geopolitical risks that we are seeing unfolding in uh, Crimea, Russia, and the Ukraine. For SA investors, many of the themes I've spoken about in a Ford International Fund is mirrored in the global component of the flexible mandate. And that is roughly half of the assets of the Ford, the Ford Flexible Fund. The other 50% is invested in RAND assets, the majority in equities. Of that equity allocation, only a small allocation is made in commodity businesses, which are trading at peak earnings and low multiples. And we should not mistake the valuation of offering good value for those businesses, given that many of the commodities are trading at very high levels compared to the past. As I've mentioned before, SA investors should favor non-commodity RAND hedges for inflation protection within their mandates. And that you can see if you look at the component that is invested in the flexible mandate that is not invested in SA Inc. businesses. The majority is sitting in non-resource RAND hedges. There is still a fair allocation to SA businesses within the Ford Flexible Fund. And we've been able to allocate quite a decent amount of our investors' capital in the last two years in many of these businesses at a time when the valuations were significantly better compared to where they are trading today. In a flexible mandate, we also continue to own a decent allocation to gold for the reasons I've mentioned before. And unlike in global developed markets, we continue to hold an allocation to government bonds in the flexible mandate. This allocation has, however, been lowered quite significantly through the last couple of months, quarters in fact, as bond yields initially fell, but secondly, as the risk of inflation globally start to, uh, started to increase. As a conclusion, allow me to say a couple of words. And the first is to mention that the risk that inflation poses to our investors are real. But as stewards of our investors' capital, we have to take responsibility 
to protect their life savings against this specific risk. We are aware that in doing so, we might miss out on some of the excess returns that's offered by the Goldilocks scenario. However, we are also not blind to the fact that many of the so-called assets or things that appeared to be beautiful today are in fact pumpkins. So rather than a beautiful coach, for example. And we are concerned that when the clock do strike 12 o'clock, does strike 12 o'clock, that the couch turn into a pumpkin and it is trampled by the horses. As responsible investors, we need to ensure that we need to leave the ballroom before the clock strikes 12 and exit while the doors are wide open. Nick, with those thoughts, I'm going to hand back over to you. Thank you, Willem, and uh, thank you, Ishrith. Uh, hopefully that's given you all a, a good context in terms of what's happening uh, in the Ford portfolios and, and helping your conversations with, with investors both around past performance and, and what to expect going forward. I think just before I open to questions, uh, uh, just a couple of key comments I, I wanted to conclude with. And, and, and one is that, I mean, you can see that we've got a, a higher than usual concern for risk of permanent capital loss, which, as you know, is what, what, what keeps us uh, 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 very focused through time, um, but very importantly, you know, we're dealing with the future, and that's why we quite like the scenario approach that, that Williams mapped out, and you'll notice probabilities attached to that. Um, you know, the future is uncertain, so um, you know our views around the folly of hiding in cash, trying to sell in and out, you know, trying to time markets, so, so even though we are using words like defensive and cautious, you will note that, that using the Ford International Fund as our sort of best view global uh, multi-asset um, absolute return uh, uh, fund. Uh, you know, we still net over 50% in equities even after a, a 23 odd percent uh, hedge on the S&P 500. So we're sort of tactically managing those market risks, and we think we're into an environment where there'll be equities and equities. Um, you know, and, and all the way down to security level, there, there's going to be very disparate outcomes. So we think protection against inflation is not as simple as, as you know hiding in cash or hiding in this asset classes versus versus that. So that diversification is crucial, and importantly. Um, that's what we do for your investors. So we're not ringing a bell. We very much are not telling you to sell out and put cash under the market in a rising inflation environment that worked for a might feel safe for a short period of time, but it's, it's almost guaranteed to uh, erode capital through time. So, so maybe I'll just some views on Tencent. Um, it's, it's a large exposure effectively through the JSE. We get a lot of questions in South Africa around views on Tencent. You've talked to China Tech, but, but maybe some specific comments there. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, Tencent, uh, it's, uh, I mean, a, a fantastic company. I would consider it a, sort of a crown, crown jewel um, within not just China, but, but I, I would say globally, especially given where the valuation of the business is today. Um, and I mean, what's, what's special about Tencent is, I mean, there, there, are, there are many, many aspects of it, but uh, I'll, I'll touch on the key ones. Uh, number one, I, I guess Tencent is probably the most sticky uh, platform that owns the entire uh, Chinese uh, user base. Uh, so that's 1.3 billion plus users uh, who use the platform incessantly on a daily basis all day long uh, for all their digital needs from sort of gaming to chat to uh, banking financial needs uh to uh, shopping or, or or whatnot um and if you compare that to say an apple uh that has uh, a user base of a, a billion users um the extent to which tencent uh is integrated into people's lives in china is, is so extensive um and their monetization of that connection with the users is is still very much in its early stages i mean even if you look at sort of uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the financial uh, or fintech uh, aspect of it, it's, it's all just getting started. Advertising is just getting started. Uh, they have a very large and mature gaming business, but even that's growing uh, still um, at least 10% uh, on a normalized basis within China. And then uh, now uh, 
uh, they've expanded that business globally as well. Um, and and that that that's just the core business, uh, and, and that that's not even the most interesting part. Um, and that core business, by the way, is is probably going to compound at at least twenty percent an annum uh, over sort of the next decade or so. Um, and then the other part, uh, and this is what uh, makes Tencent truly unique, uh, even from a global perspective. As I mentioned uh, uh, during my presentation. Uh, these Chinese management teams, and particularly, specifically Tencent, um, have taken all the cash that they've generated over the past 10 years uh, since they've been uh, experiencing this rampant growth within the internet landscape, and reinvesting all that cash in, back, back into uh, capitalizing on this user base and acquiring other platforms and technology businesses um, that they can then plug in and, and uh, uh, sort of participate in that success as well. So, for example, they own, uh, I mean, everything from sort of Tesla to which, which uh, incidentally, they acquired sort of at the very bottom of Tesla stock price uh, maybe three years ago when they were having uh, production issues. And that, that investment alone has probably uh, risen at least 20 times in the, in the last uh, sort of uh, two and a half, three years. Uh, which goes to show their prowess. I mean, this, it's not just Tesla. They've sort of acquired Snap to DD, uh, uh, JD.com uh, to Bike. I mean, you, you name it, there's pr probably in every single uh, great technology business within uh, the China's venture landscape they've invested in. And not just that, they, they, they keep generating more cash that they, that they can continue to do this with. Um, and that's around $25 billion. So, so the, just the value of these investments that they've made over the past decade now amount to around $200 billion. And Tencent's entire market cap is around $600 billion, uh, maybe, uh, maybe less than that uh, given the recent uh, stock price. But, um, but and, and, and that $200 billion is also at a de depressed level today given, given sort of the macro slowdown and sentiment around China. Um, and so, I mean, to be able to do that, what you really have is, is sort of a, a one of a kind management team that's probably among the best in the world, especially within tech. Um, I mean, it, it makes asset managers like us envious uh, when, when you look at their track record of, of uh, allocating capital and the returns they've made on that capital, which have exceeded sort of 30, 40 percent over the last sort of 10 years annualized. Um, so to be able to buy a business like that with that management team and th those businesses um, at um, now, I would say the core business is valued at less than 10 times earnings. If you if you uh, exclude the value of these investments, I mean, that that's that's truly, truly spectacular value. Um, I mean, especially given the quality, not just of the businesses, but of the management team and the uh, sort of entire setup that, that Tencent has within China, uh, and not just China, within, within the world as well, uh, in terms of where they've been making all their new incremental investments. Uh, yeah, so for the next five to 10 years, Tencent remains phenomenally positioned and uh, yeah, presents exceptional value, at least to us. Thank you, Shrith. Uh, I feel you have a conviction view there, I think, and, and, and partly informs why we, in, in our local component of the portfolio, as we, we still have a fair chunk in NASPAS as well. And I think the ability to see the funds holistically is, is, is really important, partly for that reason. So the next question is, is, to, is to William, uh, moving to a domestic focus, uh, the property sector in particular. So um, as many will know, we, we've been underwrite that, that space for, for a number of years. We were a couple of years too early, uh, looked very clever through 2020 as those risks came through 21. Uh, been a very strong bounce in that sector. Again, we, we remain largely similarly positioned, but maybe your, your views on, on, on how you think the sector is going to play out from here. Yeah, it's a, an interesting one. Um, I think to summarize it, uh, the property sector in, in SA continue to face many headwinds. Uh, we have slow economic growth. We have a property market that is oversaturated in the office space in, in many parts of, of the country. And in retail, many of the, the leases are over-rented. You can just look at some of the results from the retailers that uh, mentioned that they've been able to 
renegotiate their leases at significantly lower rentals compared to the passing passing leases. So um, number one, we think there's a lot of pressure building and that will continue to build on the actual rental income of, of property. Um, and then secondly is that there's been a move to fund at the very short end of the market. Um, and we know that interest rates are increasing. So where in the past you've had um, quite a, a bit of a, a tailwind from rental income for these property companies. Now that they need to start either to renegotiate new um, interest bearing contracts with the, the bankers or the market, those, those will, will come at, at higher rentals, not rentals, higher interest expenses. Um, and that will put uh, a bit of a dampener on the actual distributions that investors will earn. Um, the second part is that, um, as we've seen through the cycle with COVID, there is a bit of a review on how much of your distribution income you should pay out. And we in the past, many paid out 100, even more than 100% of distributable income some have started to rein back that allocation to you know, between 80 and 90%. Um, in other words, the, the yield that you are now earning from property is, is below what you thought it, it might be, and it's going to be lower going forward. And then the third point I'll just mention is that relative to government bonds, which in SA continue to offer relatively high yields, there is not really the need to take on that additional risk for a big size in the portfolio to earn a real income of four or five percent. We think you get sufficient compensation by taking on SA government bonds. And it, in our opinion, will outperform many of the lesser property companies locally. Thank you. Uh, Yes, uh, I think one, one in, in your wheelhouse, um, it was just a, a question around the, the so-called energy transition, uh, the sort of bigger picture move away from fossil fuels. And uh, in particular, I know we've got a, an interesting view on, on the utility sector. Uh, maybe just give us some thoughts there, please. Sure, Nick. Um, yeah, so I, I think, I mean, that's another very interesting space uh, because I guess, uh, I mean, wherever there's, there's a change and disruption, there's also uh, opportunity, um, and that, that's kind of how we how we look at disruption as a whole. Um, and the energy energy industry, I mean, needs to needs to change quite a bit over the next few years because uh, clearly, with with all the concerns around uh, decarbonization and and what needs to happen uh, for for those goals to be met uh, with with things like the Paris Accord. Um, I mean, you need like the world consumes most of its energy today in the form of uh, molecules. And what needs to now happen is that this energy needs to go from 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 being in the form of molecules to to electrons. So, um, I mean, I mean, taking you take Europe, for example, 80 percent of the energy today still comes from uh, fossil fuels like oil, gas, coal uh, or, or whatnot. Um, and if they are to achieve their decarbonization goals over the next sort of 10, 20 years, that needs to move from 80% to 50%. And the, uh, the, the energy derived from electrons uh, or electrification needs to go from 20 to 50%. Um, and, and obviously all that energy also needs to come in the form of renewable uh, electricity as well. Um, which which the current uh, sort of environment is not at all positioned to provide, um, and and in terms of utilities, so, I mean the energy side is one aspect of it, and then the utility side is another aspect of it. So uh, and there are there are energy companies that are also investing in in becoming utilities, like most of the European players, but but uh, I mean the utility uh, sector or the business itself is is a regulated business, you know, so. I mean, what drives returns in, in utilities is typically uh, the opportunity to invest uh, and in, increase or grow your regulated asset base. Uh, that's one aspect of it. And the other is the returns allowed by the regulator 
uh, to to encourage this uh, this investment. And and given given sort of this big jump that needs to happen uh, in terms of ele electrification, I mean the the regulators globally are, are, are very supportive of of investment uh, by utilities, um, and the extent to which they'll have to invest also needs to be extremely, um, I mean, quite heavy compared to what they've been investing over the past sort of decade or so. So yeah, we, I mean, we, we, we definitely like certain aspects of the utilities market, especially where, where the returns uh, are, are permitted are attractive and where the management teams can, can invest uh, quite uh, heavily uh, to, to grow their regulated asset base. So, uh, I mean, we, we, we own a few utilities along these, uh, these lines like uh, SSC, uh, Edison Electric is another one. Um, we also own Quanta, uh, Quanta Services, which is uh, 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 an engineering ENC company that, that uh, enables this build out over time. Uh, so, so yeah, uh, utilities uh, should be a very interesting space over the next uh, sort of decade or two uh, as this energy transition takes place. Thanks, Ashit. Uh, and then uh, just one for William, we've got some general questions around commodities, obviously been a big driver in our more domestic portfolios, less so in the, in the, in the Ford multi-asset funds. We, we've had a, a, a fair overweight actually in the sector in the, in the international funds because we've, we've been able to, to get some specific allocations there. Um, but maybe just the view generally, obviously we, we, we've seen them, them kicking, uh, kicking higher, where, where, you know, where to from here? I don't know that uh, answer, Nick. <laughs> um, but there, there does seem to be uh, a bit of a divergence between the different commodities. And you know, if Ishwet has spoken about the transition of, of the grid, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the commodities that we believe longer term is where you want to be invested in for that specific transition is, is copper. And it is one of those that we believe through you know, holding in a company like Anglo-American, for example, will offer investors with an income stream that is likely to be more predictable and stable compared to uh, a business that is more exposed to, to other um, core minerals like iron ore, for example, which are quite linked to the, the Chinese economic cycle. Um, and as they slow down, you'll probably see that the price of you know, commodities like iron or even coal start to, to trend lower. Um, we, we want to avoid as much as possible sectors or, or asset classes where at some point in the future we see that there is a, a terminal growth rate that's, you know, that's zero or negative. And some commodities domestically does, does seem to you know, be part of that mold of, of, of assets or asset classes, which is why we don't have a huge amount of, of platinum exposure in our portfolios. Um, gold we, we like, as I've mentioned, because of the protection against inflation exceeding expectations. Uh, it doesn't, gold doesn't do well in all inflation cycles, but when inflation does exceed expectations and builds momentum, it, it seems to, to do well. Um, but we're also not blind to the fact that all this free money that has been created by central banks has made its way into asset classes like commodities as well. And you know, when there is a pullback in liquidity and economies start to slow down as they're starting to reassess what, what low liquidity levels mean, um, you'll probably find that many of those industrial commodities outside of copper do not do as well as what you would have expected. Thanks, William. Uh, yeah, all our talk about nursery rhymes this morning, we, we seem to have a, a revenge by the musicals being struck by the sounds of silence for a moment uh, during my raps. So I, I just wanted to repeat some of, some of the, the quick comments um, before, we, before we close out, just aware of the time. Um, yeah, I, I was just saying that uh, although we've, we've mapped out some, a couple of fairly scary scenarios, that, you know, the, the message certainly isn't to, you know, to try and time the markets, uh, go to cash. There are some scenarios where, where, where cash would certainly will win in the, in, in the near term, but I think you, you're well aware of our views of 
uh, the folly of trying to time markets, um, and certainly in a rising inflation market, uh, inflation environment, we, we don't think that that's a, a long-term home for, for long-term savings. Um, so even though we have, we, you know, we, we have a cautious stroke defensive position in place, you'll notice in the Ford International Fund as, as, as the one that William finished up on, um, you know, we, we still have a net long equity exposure there of over 50%. Um, that's after the, the 20 plus percent hedge on, on the S&P 500, which, which is mostly through, through futures. So those are risks that we are, are, are managing tactically, um, and, and this really is where, where, you know, where managers like ourselves um, truly do earn their stripes. So um, you know, this is, is where you'll see our portfolio managers sort of skipping around the office because it's, it's where we see maximum opportunity and, and, and maximum um, uh, opportunity to, to justify existence in, in, in terms of risk management for, for your investors. So I'm aware of the time. Um, we, we, we're very grateful that you have uh, joined us and, and stayed on for as long as you have. Um, any questions that we haven't been able to get to, we will uh, come back to you um, um, specifically uh, post, the, post the session. Um, and again, we, we, we really appreciate your time and um, are honoured and privileged to uh, have the um, um, opportunity to steward your, your investor assets. So uh, thank you very much and we look forward to our, our next chat. Thank you. I've been warm and I've been cold It's been drifting in my bones It's been a long, long year Another time, another place It's been happening every day And it's just good to have you here See, you know some things go straight to the moon What you did and I know that you did and I soon And what you see that I didn't do Not what you told me to you watch out. Go see ya. Sun, so close to your heart, and it will take you alive, it will burn you up inside. Told you to
singing now.